Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute at the University of Melbourne. I'm Georgina Downer and I'm the host of Afternoon Light and the CEO of the Robert Menzies Institute. The Institute is a Prime Ministerial Library and Museum devoted to upholding the legacy and vision of Sir Robert Menzies, Australia's longest serving Prime Minister. On Afternoon Light, we explore contemporary issues relevant to Sir Robert's life and legacy with leading thinkers from around the world. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome, and today on the Afternoon Light podcast, I'm talking to Dr. Ben Wilkie, and Ben is a historian and honorary associate in La Trobe University's Centre for the Study of the Inland, and he has also authored a book, The Scots in Australia, 1788 to 1938, and Gary Word, An Environmental History of the Grampians, which won the Local History Small Publication Award in the 2020 Victorian Community History Award. So welcome to the Afternoon Light podcast, Ben. Uh, It's good to be here. And today, Ben, I wanted to talk to you about Menzies and his Scottish roots, but also the importance of um, Scottish people and the Scottish Enlightenment to Australian liberalism and our early development. And there is, I think, no better person to talk to about these issues than you. So um, really looking forward to this discussion. I guess picking up, of course, on your on your book, The Scots in Australia, it would be good to just get a, a general overview about what what is the influence and role of the Scottish migrants in Australia um, who came out well, as you say in your book, from 1788, the first of the European settlers amongst the, the English and the Irish, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, so the Scots began coming to Australia not predominantly as convicts, but mostly as colonial authorities and pastoralists and administrators and that sort of thing. So Out of, you know, 150,000-odd convicts, only about 8,000 were Scots. So most of the Scots coming to Australia were were sort of people who chose to come here and had the means to come here as well. So they tended to be fairly well-educated, middle-class types of people who were looking for opportunities in Australia, basically. And this is this becomes kind of a theme when it comes to Scottish migration, is that it it often is about... um, seeking those opportunities abroad. And for the Scots, Australia represented, you know, a whole lot of opportunity in terms of being able to to use their, their education to, to access those those administrative or those positions of, of authority, those professions, but also to be able to use their family's wealth to, to buy property, to buy land, become pastoralists and have influence in that way. So the Scots are very much overrepresented in those, I guess, those colonial elites. Yeah, that's um, that's fascinating and, and gives, a, I guess, a good picture of where they fit in the demographic profile of our early settlers in Australia. They, they tended to be people who were of the middle class. They were aspirational, they were hardworking and, and you know, who better to um, show a shining example of that than James and Kate Menzies, the parents of, of Sir Robert Menzies, Australia's longest serving Prime Minister. They were hardworking people, resident in... Um, I think originally in Ballarat, where you are, where you are based these days. But of course, Robert Menzies was born while James and Kate Menzies were in Japarat in northwestern Victoria, a very very small country town. They didn't have much money, but they had that incredible commitment to their kids' education, didn't they? That and that's that's quite prevalent throughout. Scottish migrants in Australia is that real sense that education was an important way of ensuring that their kids could give back to society. Yeah, education was hugely important for Scottish migrants. And in Scotland, I mean, the background to this is interesting because Scotland, under the Act of Union in 1707, it basically loses its parliament. But what it retains is its church, the, the Church of Scotland, which is a Presbyterian church. It retains its laws, its legal system. So Scots law is still a distinct area of law and it retains its educational institutions. So those those sort of three things, law, the church and education or schools, 
a kind of become Scotland's, I guess, national institutions. And so there's this huge emphasis on education, um, not only because of that, but also because it ties in with, I guess, this broadly sort of Presbyterian cultural idea of self-help and being in a position to get yourself ahead and doing what's um, what is needed for for people to basically be able to contribute to society so to provide the means to do that and from the 17th century right through to Robert Menzies education is, is basically seen as is the primary means of enabling people to be able to be in the best position to contribute to progress and improve themselves. And, and on top of that, Ben, the liberal tradition in, that came out of Scotland was very much predominant among Scottish Australian migrants, wasn't it? The, this, and that focus on suffrage, at least for, for men originally, lamb reform, as you said, for education, but particularly free and compulsory schooling. And the Scottish Pre- Presbyterians in Australia had a particular zeal for state education, seeing, as you said, the school is the very foundation of, of any community. Another notable aspect of um, Scottish uh, Presbyterians and um, new migrants to Australia was their emphasis on free trade, which was interesting and you know not necessarily a commonly shared view. Can you talk to me, Ben, about what the impact of, of these sort of Scottish Enlightenment views were on the um, early development in Australia? So the the Scottish Enlightenment, it's a really good case study of how ideas come to Australia and how they are accepted or rejected or changed over time because of the local circumstances here, basically. And someone like the Scottish governor of New South Wales, um, Lachlan Macquarie, is really illustrative here. In Under uh, Macquarie's governorship, Scottish observers back home would often say that he didn't really seem to know what he was doing in terms of economics. You know, he was absolutely not a free trader and the the entire society and economy of early colonial Australia was was really locked down, basically. And so Scottish observers would say that, um, you know, the, the governors of Australia should be taking exams on, on um, Adam Smith because they didn't know what they were doing. But there was the other side of Smith as well and the other side of sort of Scottish Enlightenment thinking, which was really about moral philosophy. And for Macquarie, that's where the Enlightenment really comes through, um, especially in his approach to to convicts. So, so, for example, pardoning convicts and providing tickets of leave and sort of accepting con- ex-convicts back into society. And it, that came from a very sort of Scottish view of justice and crime and punishment, which saw crime not so much as an individual um, shortcoming, but more to do with, they would, it, is, it sort of sounds quite modern, but they saw it as, being really about just the distress of the community from which criminals came from rather than the criminal's own sort of depravity. That's a very interesting perspective. And so the so the idea is that the criminal was not, uh, or someone who committed a crime was not um, criminal because of their, their nature, but because of the, the nurture of the, 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 the experience, the sort of community had driven them to criminality rather than something inherently wrong in the, in the individual. Yeah, essentially that was the idea. And I guess these, these Scottish thinkers around punishment and justice and so on were experiencing the Scottish cities, which were growing. And um, there was a lot of distress in those cities um, due to economic changes, uh, overpopulation, crowding, things like that. So there, there were skyrocketing rates of crime. And I guess they were looking at it that and, and trying to square the circle in terms of their own views of what people were inherently like. And they basically believed that people were, were inherently good and that it's the, that exposure to certain situations that, that leads to, to crime. And basically that's, that's why that someone like Lachlan Macquarie would come along and say, well, these convicts can actually be fixed. I can improve them. And that was very much in line with his whole thinking about what his job was as a governor was to bring order to the colony and to do that would bring about improvement and progress. And so that was that's kind of a good example of the general thinking in the early 19th century that, that came from a lot of Scottish people who basically saw Australia as a testing ground 
for their ideas. It's the kind of place that could be uh, improved if you apply the right kinds of ideas uh, rationally. And that idea that Australia was essentially a progressive colony that you were testing new ideas. Of course, Australia was inheriting long-standing British institutions and there was that element of conservatism, but, but the, there was an opportunity to test out some of the, the philosophies and ideas that were coming out of that 18th, 19th century intellectual milieu in the UK and in, across Britain and Scotland. Can you tell me then, Ben, because of course Robert Menzies is, is you know, known as a a father of Australian liberalism, particularly through his founding of the Liberal Party in 1944, but that he didn't come out of a vacuum. He, of course, came out of several decades of of debates around uh, liberal ideas in Australia, really going right back to to the 19th century. What does Australian liberalism then owe to its Scottish forebears Um, and, you know, obviously Robert Menzies particularly owes to his Scottish forebears. Yeah, so if you ask a Scottish historian who knew nothing about Australian history, they'd say that Scottish liberalism was basically about the middle class as against the wealthy or the elites and it was basically about ideas like self-help and thrift and hard work Uh, independence and respectability. And those were Presbyterian ideas as well. And there was that, as we mentioned, that practical emphasis on education, enabling people to get ahead, providing the means by which they could contribute to society. And those ideas, I guess, for anyone who's listened to this podcast or, or knows a bit about Menzies or the history of Australian liberalism will sound quite familiar. One aspect of the Scottish tradition that didn't quite take root in Australia in the 19th century in the way it did in Scotland, is free trade. And, of course, there were huge debates in the middle of the 19th century and onwards about protectionism versus free trade. So there were Australian free trade liberals and they were basically in the business of restating Adam Smith. You know, some of the earliest works of, um, you know, Australian authored political economy really do just reiterate um, what Smith and and others said about, about free trade. And a lot of the, the, the free trade in Australia were Scottish. So the, 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 the big one being the New South Wales Premier and the later Prime Minister, George Reid. And then on the other side, of course, you have the protectionists. And funnily enough, one of the, one of the leading advocates of the protectionist viewpoint or movement in Australia was David Syme, who was the, the leader of the, the Age newspaper, and he was also Scottish. So, so these debates were, you know, were, were full of Scots, you know, partly because they were prominent in the positions that would enable them to, to speak up on these issues. But the long story short, obviously, is that the free trade position was not so successful uh, in, in a place like Victoria. It was a bit more successful in New South Wales. And, of course, when it came time for Federation and the Commonwealth, you had that fusion of in you know, embodying people like Alfred Deakin of, of liberalism and protectionism, which became that kind of you know, Australian expression. Ben, I wanted to ask you about why so many important Australian liberals, and I say liberal, as, liberals as in capital L liberals, have been of Scottish de- descent. You've got um, obviously Robert Menzies, you've got Malcolm Fraser, Rupert Hamer. But is, is there a reason why descendants of Scottish migrants in Australia tended to be liberals rather than Labor, or are there, are there many on the Labor side as well? I mean, in these days you look at Scotland, of course, modern-day Scotland, and it's not uh, got a huge representation on the, um, on the centre-right. It, it tends to be, um, well, Scottish nationalists or Scottish Labor. But uh, in Australia, the Scottish descendants tend to be very much on the on the centre right the liberal side of australian politics is that for cultural reasons that might have dissipated in the in the mother country yeah so this is this is an interesting um, sort of development over the 19th and 20th centuries because you have a dominance of liberalism in the 19th century in scotland scottish migrants to australia from that time tend to also gravitate towards that side of politics scots you know, in a sense, in some ways shaped the the Australian liberal movement. 
but they were also they also had an affinity with with some of those ideas I've already mentioned. So so that first generation or the nineteenth century generation of migrants does tend to gravitate towards the, the centre right. But then at the end of the nineteenth century, Scotland becomes basically the vanguard of British labour politics and British socialism as well. So what you then get is a younger generation of Scots coming through into the 20th century who are much more prominent in the labour side of things. Um, So even in the 19th century, you do have Scottish representation among Australian trade unionists. Um, The first unionist in a colonial legislature was a Scot. Uh, You have Andrew Fisher, the first Labor Prime Minister. He was Scottish and had grown up as basically a radical unionist in Scotland. So you get this shift between generations and then tracing it after that obviously becomes a bit difficult as sort of, you know, the generations move on and, and people find their own way. But certainly, historically speaking, you do have Scottish migrants basically representing what was happening at home and those shifts that were happening at home as well. Yeah, it's um, it's fascinating to see um, how the politics can evolve outside of the the the, co- the domestic context as as uh, our Scottish migrants here in Australia evolve their own philosophies localized to Australian conditions and things change in Scotland, particularly of course these days with the nationalist movement, the independence movement, uh, the politics becomes so very different and we're almost sort of stuck in a, a point in time in Scottish ideas in Australia that that you know has has moved on uh, where it originated. I wanted to talk now um, about Robert Menzies and his connection to um, Scotland, to his Scottish roots. He Obviously, his parents were children of the Scottish migrants. But um, Robert Menzies, as Prime Minister, he received two significant awards for his contribution to the United Kingdom. One was as Lord Warden of the Sink Ports um, on his retirement, the Queen um, awarded him that position, which was um, one that had been held by Winston Churchill previously. And upon Robert Menzies' death, the Queen Mother became the Lord Warden of the Sink Ports. So obviously given to someone who had a significant connection to the monarch, but also to protecting the safety of the United Kingdom. Um, but Menzies also was awarded the Order of the Thistle, wasn't he? The uh, th- most ancient and most noble Order of the Thistle. <laughs> uh, apologies, apologies. Well, tell me about the Order of the Thistle. <laughs> Please do, and why it was significant and what it what it told us about um, the importance of, of um, Menzies to Scotland and vice versa. So the, the Order of the Thistle is a, is a Scottish order of chivalry that was basically developed in the 17th century under King James. And it's one of the oldest orders. And I guess what it says about, well, what it hints at about Menzies is that there is some really important Scottish connection here. So the the, the reasons for, for, for him being awarded that I'm not fully up to date on, but basically for me, the award of that, the Order of the Thistle, um, it really symbolises, especially alongside his other awards, kind of uh, symbolises the kinds of allegiances that Menzies had and the diversity of those allegiances. And what I'm interested in, obviously, is, is the Scottish connection. Of course. And, uh, I mean, he he obviously was... Um receiving a great honour when he received the Order Order of the Thistle and I understand was the only Australian ever appointed to the Order um, and the second of only two Australian Prime Ministers to be knighted during their term of office. So, you know, quite a considerable achievement. In terms of Menzies' political thought and, of course, you know, really embodied in his Forgotten People broadcast through 1942 and 43. How important do you think his the influence of Scottish thought and traditions were in in underpinning that thinking? There's, I mean, a particularly memorable feature in his Forgotten People speech is his reference to Robert Burns's poem, "The Cotter's Saturday Night," and he, I can quote. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure. 
nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile, the short and simple annals of the poor, which um, really resonated the... um, I think as as a free trade Liberal Prime Minister of Australia, George Reid, once described, was that um, beautiful picture of the domestic virtues and religion and a real sort of idealised image of Scotland's rural poor. But, of course, for Menzies, this was about the, the virtues of the middle class, wasn't it, Ben? Yes, that line of line from Robert Burns and, and the poem it's taken from, the, the Cotter's Saturday Night, it really speaks to those core, I guess, moral ideas from the Scottish liberal tradition around personal ambition and quiet achievements and the desire to be active and responsible citizens, which is all grounded in the home, which is also a theme that comes out through the forgotten people. But I just want to go back a little bit in terms of Menzies' Scottish connection more generally. You know, it's it's often said that it was, you know, been often remarked that, you know, Menzies loved Britain or that he loved England. Um, and, and something that's worth distinguishing here is that he also felt in himself that he was Scottish or was a descendant of Scots. He described himself as a Scottish chauvinist um, and he often refers to um, <laughs> his, his Scottish background. So, so as we know, his, his grandfather was a Scottish farmer. They migrated to Australia. His father for a time was a Presbyterian elder, uh, later became a Methodist preacher. If you look at Menzies' personal library, you see that he's got an interest in all things Scotland, um, in, in, in Scottish politics and history and culture, including the complete works of, of Robert Burns. You look at his, his sort of... Uh, civic activities. He's president of a, of a club called the Melbourne Scots, which is a fairly prominent club, uh, gentleman's club basically in Melbourne, also associated with people like Malcolm Fraser, uh, Weary Dunlop, Billy Snedden, Rupert Hamer. He's the president of the Royal Caledonian Society, um, which is also associated with, with people of power and influence that are of Scottish descent as well. So these are sort of really important organisations and, and um, activities that Menzies is involved with. And it's funny, he says, he, he tells the Caledonian Society that he's actually embarrassed that he doesn't have a Scottish accent and he's more interested in cricket than <laughs> traditional Highland games. <laughs> no, it's, um, it's fascinating and actually we're putting together an exhibition at the Robert Menzies Institute, Ben, and um, uh, some uh, members of the Menzies family have have very kindly loaned us items from uh, from f- f- that Sir Robert Menzies owned, um, and uh, one is a dirk, which is the the traditional knife, uh, and uh, another is a is a sort of a shepherd's crook that has uh, the the um, Menzies um, motto on it, and also a, a Scottish thistles, and uh, in his office, I understand, at um, at home in Haverbrack Avenue, he had tartan, Menzies tartan curtains uh, at his window um, in the black wow. and white morning tartan, which we are also installing in the Robert Menzies Institute in uh, uh, recognition of that Menzies um, heritage and, and, of course, his, his Scottish, Scottish heritage. Uh, I wondered if you could reflect, Ben, on... Um, on more contemporary issues now uh, and we could talk about the legacy of Scottish influence in Australian politics today do we do we still see it do we see it in the in the liberal party as a, poly, a embodiment of of um, Australian liberalism but you know obviously those Scottish enlightenment values is there is there much that we can we can see or or as we have we moved on look i think quite often um, the, the modern Liberal Party still looks back, you know, quite often to the influence of Menzies and, um, you know, you, you do often see those those forgotten people broadcasts um, being being quoted, especially at that central one that refers to, you know, the Cotter's Saturday night and, and home spiritual and so on. And I guess if those are taken as kind of um, in a kind of general sense as kind of founding statements of, of modern Liberal philosophy, in Australia, you do see that that Scottish influence quite um, substantially. You know, M- Menzies brought to 
those speeches and also to his sort of his career and his thought, some of those core Scottish liberal ideas around both individualism but also a sense of duty to society. So there were these kind of two things weighed up and you see that in the Forgotten People speeches and you see that also in in various speeches he gave to these Scottish associations that I mentioned. So, and and, and those sorts of things are sort of coupled with this emphasis on education, um, the importance of saving for the future, this line about dependence on God and independence of man, the duty to society and those in need being balanced with individual aspiration. And those sorts of ideas, I, I don't want to be too sort of prescriptive in saying that, you know, Robert Menzies was this political philosopher and he had all these ideas worked out, but they are very much echo those core 19th century Scottish ideas. And it's interesting with his interest in Robert Burns, the poetry of Robert Burns, Burns was in turn a, an avid reader of Adam Smith's moral philosophy, not necessarily the wealth of nations, but the theory of moral sentiments, which is where this idea that, that society, the, the moral sense of people in a society very much comes from a sense of altruism and um, communitarianism, which is, again, balanced by individual aspiration. And I think it's it's quite arguable that he, that those ideas come from Smith, from the Scottish Enlightenment, through um, th- through people like Robert Burns, who is immensely popular. Um, someone like Menzies is growing up in a basically Scottish household. He's reading Burns. He's reading Scottish history, which is also written with an eye on these ideas, and they're coming through in his career as the politician, and in turn sort of tracing it, you know, continuing to trace it, um, they become massively in influential uh, in the modern Liberal Party. And what I find interesting is um, that that sense to, and and it came from, from I think, Menzies' Scottish upbringing and, and reading of, of, you know, Scottish ideas, that Menzies had a real focus on doing things not just for the here and now, not just to enjoy the fruits of your labour today, but actually doing things with a sense of responsibility for what will happen in the future. I think he, he wrote about the importance of, um, of continuity, of the Scottish value of continuity. No great good is done by those who say, let us eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. But the man who feels pride in the past and a sense of responsibility for the future... Uh, which, um, you know, is, and I've spoken about this on Afternoon Light um, before, he really eschewed utilitarianism, didn't he? He was very much um, about, as you said, about about duty, a responsibility, not just to your neighbour today, but to your children and, and to a future Australian society. Um, and, that, and that obviously policy making and governing needed to be done with thought to building a nation, how the nation can develop into the future and and, uh, and how to create greater opportunities for individuals in society who inhabit a cohesive, close-knit community. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, those, that sort of, it's like, it's, it's, it's that kind of dual emphasis um, on society and community and, and the past and the future and the development and stability of society um, attached to what he, he described as a spirit of um, independence. So it, it, I guess that some some might look at that and say, well, that kind of embodies this broad church idea of conservatism and liberalism. And, and you know, maybe it does. Um, but certainly those two ideas are, are there and both of them um, sort of balance each other um, out, you know, that sort of sturdy independence with that eye to the future and the stability of society. Yeah, and, and reflecting on our discussion today, I, I you know, I feel like, Australian society is is you know rather than being a um, particularly 
English society as in a society that has inherited so many institutions out of England and of course it has but we have there's so much about Australian society that 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 um, resonates with Scottish ideas that we sort of fundamentally built on Scottish ideas with of course the input of um, the Westminster system and um, Magna Carta um, all those all those ideas coming from from Britain but uh, I mean I don't think it's well recognized how important um, Scottish ideas were to the founding of the sort of what what it means to be Australian that sense of egalitarianism that sense of of independence of spirit um, of of the importance of looking after your fellow man and woman uh, they they are they are Scottish ideas but they are also the sort of Australian way of life aren't they Yeah I mean it's 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 very um very much in in line with scottish thinking going back to the enlightenment you know balancing the individual and their community individual rights and civic duties looking at you know ordinary people and their their aspirations and and finding moral value in those sorts of humble lives i guess and this emphasis on on education on hard work respectability you know those things are i think it can be said things that appeal to uh, you know speaking in kind of um, political terms appeal to the electorate i guess um you know and some people have argued that it's those that that moral side to australian liberalism um that has really attracted voters across the broad middle class um, to that side of politics. Um, and so they're obviously quite popular ideas. And, you know, I'm, I'm coming into bat for the Scots. Um, someone might disagree, but I think they are, they are very um, most definitely Scottish ideas and um, that, that influence on Australia uh, when you drill down into it um, seems obvious to me. Yeah, well, I, no, I would uh, wholeheartedly agree with you, Ben. And that and that primacy of the middle class in Australian society. I mean, Menzies very much eschewed um, class warfare, class based society. He, he did not think that that was um, what you know uh, that uh, what would make us Australia a successful country. Um, we needed to forget about the classes. Um, but if we were going to focus on any so, class it would have to be the middle class who were the as he I mean has he put it the lifters not the leaners um that of course has um, become a little bit of a maligned uh, phrase these days after uh, being used by a um by a treasurer a few governments passed um to much condemnation but but you know very much people who were contributing to society who were paying their taxes, educating their children, raising their children to be good citizens, contributing citizens, um, that that middle class, um, you know, not the not the upper class, not the lower class, but those people who valued education would be what would make Australia a successful nation, which to me comes very much from that emphasis um, that you're seeing in the in the Scottish thinking. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree with all of that. I think it's um, it's fascinating once you do look at where these different influences come from, and um, you know, to to actually break apart this nebulous idea of Australia and Britain, and to say, well, let's look at Australia and Scotland, or let's look at Australia and England, or even Ireland, um, and look at the the different um, different things that have come together to make Australia what it is now. Yeah, I um I think you know little understood and uh, and of course here at the Robert Menzies Institute we will be doing um what we can to to spread these ideas and give people the opportunity to um to to debate them and and really reflect on on Australia's heritage and and where it's got us to today and of course where it can lead us to in the future. Ben, an absolute delight to talk with you today, Dr. Ben Wilkie, um, an honorary associate in La Trobe University Centre for the Study of the Inland. Um, What a fascinating discussion about Menzies and his Scottish roots and the influence of uh, Scottish uh, Enlightenment ideas on Australia's early development and present day. Thank you so much for joining the Afternoon Light podcast. Thank you. The Afternoon Light podcast is brought to you by the Robert Menzies Institute at the University of Melbourne. 
You can find more about the Institute and our podcast at robertmenziesinstitute.org.au. We're also on Twitter, on Facebook and LinkedIn. We look forward to you joining our show next week. Thank you.